Dragon is in countdown. Falcon 9 is in startup. Dragon, SpaceX, go for launch. We are just under 22 minutes from liftoff of this Falcon 9 rocket for NASA's and SpaceX's 24th Commercial Resupply Services mission to the International Space Station. The Dragon spacecraft will fly about 6,500 pounds of science, supplies, and holiday treats for the astronauts on board. Happy holidays, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this live launch coverage of CRS-24. I'm Megan Cruz. Today's liftoff is scheduled for 5.07 a.m. Eastern Time from Launch Complex 39A here at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And we are again simulcasting this live show on NASA TV and on SpaceX's webcast. So let's bring in Andy Tran now live from SpaceX's headquarters in Hawthorne, California. Good to see you, Andy. Yeah, good to see you too, Megan. It is great to be back covering today's mission in partnership with NASA. And as the year comes to an end, CRS-24 will be SpaceX's 31st and final mission of 2021, making it a record-breaking year for launches for us. What a way to end the year, Andy. And, and I see that you have a live view of the pad right now. Can you walk us through the different parts of Falcon 9 and Dragon? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, our two-stage launch vehicle stands about 70 meters tall and when fully fueled holds just over 1 million pounds of propellant that the vehicle will burn through in less than three minutes after liftoff. The bottom two-thirds of the vehicle is the first stage. Its objective is to accelerate the vehicle through the Earth's atmosphere to space and then separate from the rest of the rocket. And while today's flight is going to be the first for this booster, Falcon 9 is designed to be reusable for the reliable and safe transport of People, payloads, and, uh, people and payloads uh, into Earth orbit and beyond. And as usual, we are going to be attempting to recover the first stage on our drone ship. Just read the instructions. That's what you see on screen right now. Above the first stage is the second stage. It has a single Merlin vacuum engine which ignites after the first stage separates. The second stage is, will, is what will carry Dragon to its intended orbit, allowing the spacecraft to eventually rendezvous with the International Space Station. And speaking of Dragon, it is sitting at the very, very top of the rocket. Dragon was designed uh, from the beginning to be reused, and this version of Dragon is designed for up to five flights. Following a successful launch, this Dragon will dock itself to the International Space Station. It will join another Dragon capsule that's already attached, Capsule Endurance. This is the one that launched Crew-3 astronauts last month. So that was a quick rundown of our launch vehicles. I'll send it back to you, Megan. Thanks, Andy. And in addition to SpaceX, NASA teams both here in Florida and in Houston are monitoring this mission. Let's go to Joshua Santora here at Kennedy first. Joshua, you're listening in as the launch team considers things like weather and safety, right? That's exactly right, Megan. Yeah, a good morning to you and everybody watching. Uh, Santa Claus and his reindeer can get off the ground in any weather. Uh, our launch vehicles have launch commit criteria. Uh, unfortunately, we've been tracking, uh, we are currently no go on weather, but the great news is that we are trending towards being go here in just a few minutes. So we're hoping to hear that call uh, on time for that liftoff that we have coming up in just about 18 minutes now. Uh, that's thanks to the folks at Space Launch Delta 45, specifically Launch Weather Officer Arlena Moses providing that support um, for weather and range activity. For the countdown operations, fueling on the first stage began at T minus 35 minutes, and the second stage will begin fueling in just about two minutes at T minus 16 minutes. That's all ahead of liftoff, scheduled for 5.07.08 Eastern Time this morning. That's so precise because we have a single second to launch and rendezvous with the space station tomorrow morning. That autonomous docking that Andy mentioned is scheduled for 4.30 a.m. Eastern Time, with coverage beginning at 3 a.m. Eastern Time. For more on space station operations, I'm going to send you out now to the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, where Shaniqua Vereen is in standing by in Mission Control. Thanks, and welcome to the International Space Station Flight Control Room. I'm Shaniqua Vereen, live at Johnson Space Center here in Houston, Texas. The team of flight controllers in Mission Control Houston today has been led by Flight Director Adi Bulos. Teams here in Mission Control will really jump into action tonight into early Wednesday morning as Cargo Dragon approaches the International Space Station. There are currently seven crew members living and working aboard the station. 
Expedition 66 consists of NASA astronauts Tom Marshburn, Raja Chari, Kayla Barron, and Mark Bandahai. Roscosmos cosmonauts Piotr Dubrov, Anton Skeplerov, and Matthias Maurer of the European Space Agency. As Cargo Dragon approaches the International Space Station in the morning hours on December 22nd, NASA astronauts Rasha Chari and Tom Marshburn will be monitoring the arrival from the station's cupola. Cargo Dragon will, will remain attached to the International Space Station's forward port of the Harmony Module for about one month, being one of two Dragons joining Crew Dragon Endurance before being packed up with critical science and supplies and will splash down off the coast of Florida for that science to be analyzed back here on Earth. Everything's still a go from here in Mission Control Houston, and we're looking forward to welcoming another vehicle to the International Space Station. So for now, we'll head back out to Kennedy. Megan? Thanks, Shaniqua. We're now about 16 minutes and counting from liftoff of CRS-24. On board are more than two dozen science experiments. Here's a quick sample of some, including technology that could one day help wounds heal faster. You saw in that video that college students are sending experiments to the orbiting lab, and I have two of them here with me today. This is Swati Ravi from Columbia University, as well as Caitlin Harvey from the University of Idaho. Good morning to you guys. Good morning. Good morning. So talk to me. I know that between your two universities, 18 students are sending two experiments to space. Can you tell me about yours, Swati? Absolutely. So we're sending up two different bacteria um, that are commonly found in spaceflight environments and also the cause of some previous astronaut infections. And we're really interested in studying how they interact with each other and also how their antibiotic resistance changes in space. Oh, really interesting. And Caitlin, what about you? Yeah, so for our experiment, we're looking at how effective different um, bacterial resistant polymer coatings are on high contact surfaces in microgravity because we already know how they behave on Earth, so we want to compare those. Yeah, it sounds like both of your experiments have to do with studying how bacteria grows in space. Why is it that you guys wanted to, to hone in on that? Yes, so uh, bacterial resistance is a real problem both in space and here on Earth, and so for us it's important to study um, bacteria because um, for long-term future space flight, it's important that we keep astronauts safe and healthy. And even here on Earth, the World Health Organization has flagged antibiotic resistance as a really important challenge for us to solve. Right, yeah, and, and you hit the nail on the head, you know, as, as these missions get longer and longer when we think about Mars. So, and you know, this is all possible through NASA's Student Payload Opportunity with Citizen Science, or SPOX, program. Can you tell us what you think about the fact that NASA is investing in STEM and creating this opportunity for you guys? Yeah, I mean, I think it's an excellent 
incredible opportunity honestly once in a lifetime um it's such an inspiring way to just get ourselves involved in stem as well as all the people watching us um, along for our journey so it's truly an inspiration and i think an excellent way to get our generation involved in stem moving forward that's great and then very quickly what is it that you hope to learn from this experiment yes from our for both experiment, experiments we're hoping to learn um what kinds of antibiotics are best for us to use um, with astronauts so that we can most effectively treat their infections. And Kayla? Um, we're just looking at um, potentially reducing the contact risk of exposing yourself to bacteria. So learning how these polymer coatings work in different environments and then applying that to reduce bacterial infections. That's great. Good luck, guys. Thank you so much for joining us and, and congratulations to have this opportunity even. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much. And now let's kick it back over to Andy. Andy, CRS-24 is the final launch in a very, very busy year for you guys. Yeah, as the year comes to an end, today is going to be marking the 31st launch of 2021 for SpaceX and the fifth flight of Dragon to the International Space Station this year following the launches of Crew-2, Crew-3, and cargo resupply missions 22 and 23. It's the most launches along with the most visits to the station we've ever attempted in a given year. Uh, to give a bit of history, Dragon has been flying for 11 years now and made its debut in 2012 as the first private spacecraft in history to visit the International Space Station. Since then, it's made 28 trips to and from the orbiting lab. Today, it's one of the few vehicles that can deliver significant cargo to the space station and the only vehicle that can deliver cargo from it. Falcon 9 and Dragon were both designed with reflight in mind, and the vehicle hardware is built to support multiple missions with minimal refurbishment in between. To date, 10 of our CRS missions have flown on reused Dragons. And while it's the second flight for Dragon today, having previously flown on CRS-22, it is the first flight for our booster. It is actually the, only the second time this year we've debuted a brand new Falcon 9 first stage. To date, we've flown uh, we've reflown first stages 78 times, and that includes both the Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy flights. And we're planning to recover this one on our drone ship just with the instructions. If successful today, it will mark the 100th successful recovery of an orbital class rocket. So we are just under T-10 uh, minus 10 minutes and counting until liftoff of the Falcon 9 rocket and Dragon on the next resupply mission to the International Space Station. Back to you, Megan. Andy, thank you so much. Now NASA partners with the ISS National Lab to give others access to the orbiting laboratory. Check out this video to see which companies are flying experiments on this mission. The International Space Station is an incredible research facility that allows investigators to conduct research and technology development in ways not possible on Earth. Through the ISS National Laboratory, private sector companies can leverage the unique space environment to develop or improve consumer products and further business models, both on the ground and in low Earth orbit. Here's a quick look. Over the years, pharmaceutical leader Merck and Company has launched multiple protein crystallization investigations to the space station. In a recent ISS National Lab sponsored investigation focused on Merck's cancer immunotherapy drug, Keytruda, the team achieved exciting results. Leveraging microgravity conditions, Merck was able to produce highly uniform, concentrated crystalline suspensions of the active ingredient in Keytruda. Merck successfully translated these findings to drug production processes back on the ground, allowing the company to improve the drug formulation and delivery of Keytruda. Results could lead to additional improvements in the manufacture and storage of Keytruda, which could both reduce costs and improve quality of life for patients on Earth. Procter & Gamble, one of the leading consumer goods companies in the world, will be sending elements associated with its Tide cleaning detergent brand to the space station for evaluation. The Procter & Gamble team intends to test the stability of cleaning ingredients under microgravity conditions and radiation exposure in space. In doing so, the company hopes to gain insights that can improve the production of Tide products for consumers on Earth, while also furthering knowledge on the development of laundry detergent solutions to support long-duration spaceflight missions. To learn more about all ISS National Lab sponsored payloads on this mission, go to ISSNationalLab.org. And the Tide Experiments is pretty interesting because many of us probably have a bottle at home right now. Dr. Mark Civic is the CEO of Fabric and Home Care at Procter & Gamble. You guys make Tide. Good morning. 
It's hey. uh, so great to have you here. Thanks for having us. <laughs> uh, so tell us, you know, how do astronauts clean their clothes right now? Unfortunately, astronauts actually do not clean their clothes right now. And this resupply mission will actually supply clothing for them. And sometimes they have to wear their clothing up to four days in advance. And you can imagine that's pretty gross. So uh, <laughs> for long-term deep space missions, NASA has partnered with Tide uh, to develop a, the first detergent for space use for uh, long uh, flight missions. Uh, because it becomes cost prohibitive to send up so much clothing for a long, long-term flight. Yeah. So then, how will the experiment work? Is, is that the detergent that they would? Yeah, this try? is exactly the uh, sample of the detergent that's going to fly this uh, this morning, and uh, as the consumer expects uh, performance and cleaning from Tide, the astronauts will as well. And unfortunately, astronauts can't go around the store to get a new bottle of Tide when it runs out. So, our objective here is in this experiment to understand stability of Tide and uh, Tide Infinity specifically uh, for this experiment. And then we uh, want to learn uh, about the ingredients and in their stability through microgravity and radiation for long-term flight duration. And I would guess that if laundry is being done on the space station, it would use less water, right? Because that's a difficult resource up there. Would that mean that what we learn from this experiment could mean less water usage for us here on Earth? That's what we plan to learn. Um, we're using International Space Station as a surrogate for off-flight, uh, off-planet um, missions. And from there, we want to learn about constrained, con uh, uh, constrained environments for developing the next best uh, tide for the consumer around the globe, not just in space, but for uh, s situations in the world where resources are constrained, water usage is constrained, and so is energy. If we can get the consumer to, to use uh, uh, tide infinity in the future, for, for future cleaning at lower wash temperatures, uh, that'll help uh, society in general. Mark, thank you so much. I can't wait to see what you guys uncover. Thank you. Thank you. But it's not just science that's flying to the space station. We, of course, send supplies like food to the crew, and they'll be getting some holiday treats on this flight. Things like roasted turkey, spicy green beans, smoked seafood and shellfish, and fruitcake to help them celebrate the holidays. They'll also be getting some presents. All right, we are now T-minus five minutes and counting. Let's bring back Andy and Joshua to walk us through the final moments of the countdown. Guys. Yeah, thanks, Megan. Uh, the SpaceX team is working no significant issues right now. Uh, we're continuing to monitor weather, although it is uh, trending more and more towards green as we march towards T0. The range is also standing by to support. Uh, at this point, RP-1 fuel is completely loaded on both stages. Liquid oxygen loading is currently underway and um, should complete around the T-minus two-minute mark. We're also loading he loading helium gas into both stages. Falcon 9 uses helium as a pressure to backfill the back propellant tanks as LOX and RP-1 are consumed by the Merlin engines during ascent. Uh, helium load began before the broadcast went live and will continue to top that off as well until about a, uh, a minute and a half before launch. Andy mentioned that liquid oxygen being loaded. Uh, it's super chilled liquid oxygen. And uh, to make sure the engine startup goes well, they perform uh, engine chill. This began at T minus seven minutes, and a small amount of that LOX is flowed through the, Mergen, the Merlin engine's turbo pumps uh, to avoid thermal shock to that system uh, to allow the full flow of super chilled liquid oxygen when the, strike, when the clock strikes zero. Uh, Dragon also began its startup sequence at T minus 35 minutes when it coordinated timing with Falcon 9. It's currently undergoing vehicle health checks with the next big step happening just a moment ago uh, when Dragon transitioned to internal power. What we're seeing on screen right now, um, the clamp arms just underneath the Dragon um, have uh, begun to open up and they uh, should be completing uh, fully open right now. And the strong back, uh, which is the uh, truss structure right next to Falcon 9, is beginning to recline away to its pre-launch position about two degrees away from the vehicle. Um, it will continue to recline all the way back um, uh, as we uh, reach T0 uh, to provide clearance for the vehicle to lift off. Stage one locks load complete. In these last few minutes, Falcon 9 is performing final health checks on its primary communications, avionics, and propulsion systems in preparation for flight. We also may hear callouts that the engines are sufficiently chilled as we get closer to lift off. The checkouts of the second stage thrust vector control actuators should begin right about uh, T minus 2 minutes 30 seconds. Uh, and that's referred to as the engine wiggle test, a fairly self-explanatory name. Uh, this is where SpaceX will move the thruster nozzle, not the thrust nozzles slightly to make sure the, gu the guidance hardware is go, go for flight. 
SpaceX will do the exact same checkouts on the first stage engines just seconds before ignition. This is all still on track, uh, weather being go now uh, for a liftoff scheduled for 5.07.08 Eastern Time this morning uh, as we track towards the space station with rendezvous and docking scheduled for tomorrow morning. Space Station now tracking over Central Europe uh, and will be there with this mission for, for about a month. So at this point, uh, we are wrapping up liquid oxygen loading. Once that is done, that is all of the propellant that will be loading onto the vehicles. And that is the call out right there. So all, all propellants are loaded onto the vehicle. Uh, you Dragon is an auto that, idle. Um, we're starting to have uh, some white clouds building around the vehicle. That is condensed liquid oxygen as that super chilled liquid oxygen reaches the warmer ambient air temperatures of Florida. It'll start to form those clouds. Uh, normal and expected for us at this stage in the countdown. Ground gas uh, does continue to go smoothly as we march towards T0. At T-minus one minutes, we'll get the, the Dragon transitioned to internal power call. The Falcon 9 computers will enter startup mode and begin final pre-launch checks, guiding the rocket through the last seconds before liftoff. Falcon 9's in startup. Dragon is in countdown. So there are a couple great callouts. Both stages are now pressurizing for launch. Uh, range remains go. The weather did clear earlier and has remained green. Um, so all things, all Falcon systems. Falcon 9, CRS 24, go for launch. That's the launch director calling go for launch. We'll get an all systems go here in just a few seconds, and then we'll listen into the rest of the count. You minus 30 seconds. T minus 15 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Ignition. Lift off. Cargo Dragon soars with the final supply run in 2021 for the astronauts aboard the International Space Station. Downrange. Stage one chamber pressure is nominal. You can see him passing through the cloud layers right now. Next up, uh, in just a few seconds here, is Max Q. This is where the vehicle will experience the highest amount of aerodynamic pressures. period of high pressure on the vehicle. The engines on the first stage are now throttling back up as we continue to make our journey to orbit. Coming up in about a minute are three events in rapid succession. Uh, first up is main engine cutoff, also known as MECO, back engine chill followed started. by stage separation, and then second engine start, also known as SES-1. Main engine cutoff is where all nine engines on the first stage will shut off in preparation for the second event, stage separation. Uh, during stage separation, the first and second stages will yes, separate from one another. The first stage yeah, makes its way back to the drone ship for a landing attempt, and the second stage will ignite its Merlin vacuum engine and continue to boost Dragon to low Earth orbit. Again, those are gonna be happening in rapid succession in about 15 seconds here.
Nico. State separation confirmed. In recognition. You heard the call outs, we see it on screen. Successful main engine cutoff, followed by successful stage separation and then ignition of our Merlin vacuum engine. On the left hand side of the screen, the first stage, again, it's making its way back to Earth, but it's still being illuminated by the second stage Merlin vacuum engine there. So if you are just joining us, you're watching a live webcast for the 24th commercial resupply mission to the International Space Station for NASA. This is SpaceX's 31st mission for 2021 and the fifth Dragon flight to the International Space Station this year. A couple of views well, on screen. The right hand side of the screen trajectory. is a view of the Merlin vacuum engine uh, on the second stage. The Dragon capsule uh, uh, carrying all of the wonderful uh, holiday treats and science is on the opposite end of that engine. Again, that is continuing to run smoothly as it makes its way to orbit. On the left-hand side of the screen is the first stage. You'll notice some uh, honeycomb-like structures. There's two of them on screen right now. Those are our um, uh, hypersonic grid fins. They're positioned at the top of the first stage booster. There are four of them, actually, uh, and those will start to um, uh, swivel and move around to make sure that they are guiding the first stage back uh, to its targeted landing zone. Uh, for, t for today's mission, it's going to be the drone ship Just Read the Instruction, which is parked in the Atlantic Ocean. Next event for our mission today is going to be the first stage entry burn. It's going to be the first of two burns. In order to make its way back to our drone ship, um, the first stage has to execute these two burns. The first, again, is the entry burn where three of our Merlin engines will reignite. This helps to slow the stage down as it re-enters the upper parts of the Earth's atmosphere. The second burn is the landing burn. This happens about a minute later. Um, this is a single engine burn that will bring the vehicle speed down rapidly in order to land on the drone ship. So again, the first stage has two burns before it can make uh, its first landing attempt uh, on our drone ship. As we wait for that event, uh, you might be interested to know that in order to get into space, the rocket actually has to do more than go up. It actually has to go sideways really, really fast. Uh, at liftoff, gravity is pulling straight down on the rocket. And as we ascend, we tilt the engines, a, a term called gimbling, and that turns the rocket horizontally. So we're still going up, but we're also heading horizontally away from the launch pad uh, in what we call a gravity turn. Stage one FTS is safe. Things continue to go smoothly for both the first and second stages. Again, the first stage entry burn follow nominal trajectory. should start in about 10 seconds. Stage one entry burn is in startup. And there it is. Three Merlin, act, uh, Merlin engines have reignited their uh, engines and are now currently slowing down the first stage. This burn is expected to last about 30 seconds. And you can see the velocity on the bottom left-hand side of the screen. We're starting to decrease significantly. Stage one, engine burn shut down. So great news, uh, that is burn one of two complete. Uh, the Falcon 9 first stage is also equipped with four landing legs made of state-of-the-art carbon fiber with aluminum honeycomb. Uh, they're placed around the base of the rocket and deployed just prior to landing. So we are about 60 seconds away from landing the vehicle and we're traveling um, 
a significant velocity right now. This really puts into perspective the deceleration that the first stage will experience. Um, in less than the span of a minute, we'll reduce from twice the speed of a jet all the way down to zero as the rocket lands. H1 is transonic. The first stage landing burn is expected to start here in about 20 seconds uh, and last for about 25 seconds. So during the duration of that burn, we are going to be listening for the call out for SECO, which stands for second engine cutoff. Uh, the Merlin vacuum engine that you see on screen, we're going to be shutting off that engine and then listening for another call out um, for a confirmation of good orbit stage where the second stage will coast for a few minutes before separating Dragon. Stage two STS is we safe. We don't have views of the first stage right now. We looks like we got it back and the landing burn uh, stage one is landing currently deployed. underway. Back shut down. Stage one landing is confirmed. So uh, hopefully we get some visuals. Uh, there it is. So this is the Terminal first landing for this particular booster, but the 100th successful landing for an orbital class rocket. Uh, what a way to end off the year. Uh, we also heard that the uh, second engine, uh, sorry, the second stage engine, the Merlin vacuum engine, successfully shut off its engine. And uh, we're going to pause here to see if we can confirm a good orbit of the second stage. Expected loss of signal, Cape. Acquisition signal, Newfoundland. So again, this is a view of the Merlin vacuum engine. The Dragon capsule with all of its supplies is on the opposite end of that. Uh, engine. And I am getting confirmation that we do indeed have a good orbit. So the second stage is going to be coasting for a few minutes here. This is a view uh, uh, of the unpressurized cargo section of the Dragon. Um, so the second stage right now is making some small adjustments uh, during the coast phase prior to separation. We should also have video of Dragon separating from the top of the second stage itself. Should give us a nice view of that, um, the view we just saw of the unpressurized cargo section as Dragon uh, will slowly depart away from the second stage. Dragon is going to be joining the Crew-3 vehicle Endurance that is currently attached to the International Space Station and on orbit. And as always, it's always exciting to see two Dragons docked at the space station at the same time. Speaking of cargo, uh, today we'll be delivering, uh, as part of today's mission, we'll be delivering more than 6,500 pounds of science, research, crew supplies, and vehicle hardware to the orbiting lab and its crew. This includes all the science and supplies and holiday treats that we talked about earlier in the broadcast, and I'm sure the crew is looking forward to that. So we're just under a minute for Dragon to separate from the top of the second stage. Again, this is a cargo mission, so there are no, there is no crew aboard the Dragon uh, as part of today's mission. And in fact, we uh, will modify the vehicles um, slightly for these types of missions. So uh, there are no seats, there are no life support systems. This saves uh, weight. It also frees up some space for more cargo, and it also allows us to refurbish the Dragon a little bit quicker once it uh, splashes back down uh, to Earth. Uh, in about a month. Expected loss of signal, Bermuda. So we Stage separation Dragon confirmed. Separate any or second Dragon now. separation. And there it goes. Uh, again, this camera view is on the second stage, looking at the Dragon's unpressurized cargo section. The Dragon has about uh, a day before it makes its way and uh, to the International Space Station and docks. Uh, coming up is nose cone opening sequence. 
But that is going to do it for me here in Hawthorne. I'm going I'm to hand it over to Shaniqua in Houston for the next Mission Milestones. Thanks, Andy. And everything is still going well back here in Mission Control, Houston. And right after Dragon separated, it began a series of automatic checkouts, including small firings of the Draco Maneuvers thrusters. The next milestone is Nose Cone Deploy. The Nose Cone protects the docking hardware and rendezvous tracking elements of the top of Dragon during ascent. The Nose Cone Deploy uncovers the four forward bulkhead thrusters, which Dragon will use for its major burn maneuvers to catch up with the space station. Once open, the Nose Cone will stay in that position until the very end of its mission, closing prior to re-entry to provide some additional protection to that same hardware during re-entry. So right now we're waiting to hear confirmation that the nose cone is fully deployed. And after confirmation, we'll have one of the program managers here join me on console. Join me virtually, sorry. You're currently seeing live views of the International Space Station Flight Control Room. You currently see Flight Director Adi Bulos standing as we wait for that final confirmation of nose cone deploy. Now joining me on the phone is manager of the International Space Station Transportation Integration Office, Phil Dempsey. Hi, Phil. Can you outline some of the major activities for the crew with CRS-24? Sure. Thanks, Shaniqua. Um, first of all, let me just say, you know, it's uh, great to watch this outstanding launch, you know, kind of watching through the weather and manage to get a shot through and uh, great to see Dragon catch up tomorrow. You know, this mission enables well over 500 hours of research, um, some of which actually has to be completed before the vehicle undocks again in about 30 days so the samples can be returned to investigators. As always, research is a key activity during this mission. We've also got the transfer of two external payloads, SCPH-7 and H-8, from the Dragon trunk to their locations on ISS. And then there's work to prepare for spacewalks planned later in the increment the coming months. There's several maintenance activities with hardware showing up on this mission. And then we have a software transition plan. So, you know, overall a lot really going on during the 30 days or so that this, this RS-24 is on to enable all of this work. That's awesome. Thank you, Phil. And of course, these resupply missions and, you you know, deliver science, as you mentioned, hardware and other cargo to the station. But with these critical deliveries to the station, how important are they for the astronauts? You said 500, over 500 uh, research activities and experiments. How important is that for us to do on the International Space Station? Yeah, so these, these missions are absolutely critical. You know, the International Space Station is, is operating for the purpose of doing research and uh, technology demonstration. So, uh, you know, we've got uh, over 24 different experiments going up on this. Um, these these five, 600 hours of crew time that it enables are key to, to what the astronauts are there for in the first place. Um, you know, and what's unique about these SpaceX missions is that we get the return science back down in about a month. Um, so operation of these experiments around this full mission timeline is critical. 
Um, you know, in addition, we've got hardware going up, as you heard, which is critical to some of the maintenance activities. Um, we've got some some uh, hardware that's going up to get one of our exercise devices, uh, a new spare back in place for it, and some additional hardware for our uh, EMUs, which are used for the spacewalks that we've got. But then there's also updated supplies for the crew. Of course, uh, you know, Christmas dinner, hopefully, and some Christmas presents for the crew, which is always a treat for them to get on these types of missions. So absolutely all of this is critical to keep the crew occupied doing what they're there for in the first place. Thanks, Phil. And we did have confirmation currently that the nose cone is deploying. It is opening currently, and I will confirm with you all when it is fully open. As always, Phil, it's a busy time aboard the International Space Station with cargo vehicles and crews coming and going. And, you know, like you mentioned, the upgraded equipment, how complex will the next few months be for the International Space Station program and the global partnership? So, you know, this is, we're closing out what's been actually a really great, really busy year, and next year looks to be uh, no different. You know, in fact, it starts uh, really tomorrow with our Russian partners following this launch with the undock of uh, module. It's really clean up from, from them installing their node module on the Russian segment. You know, there are three Russian spacewalks planned for late January. We've got some U.S. spacewalks in February and March timeframe. Uh, and that's to get ready for the, the next set of updated solar arrays coming later in the year. We've also got another cargo resupply mission, our first U.S. private astronaut mission coming up, and uh, additional resupply missions, and, and then, then we get back into the crew cycle launches on the, the Russian and the U.S. side both. So it's actually very busy across the space station program with our international commercial partners both. So while it is complex, as you said, Shaniqua, we have, we've got outstanding teams across the program who do this all the time. They do it very well. So, you know, I, I see it as really fitting that our teams close out the year with, with a launch. They get 22, 2022 off and running. That's right. And thanks as again, Phil, for joining us. And happy holidays. Back happy here. Happy holidays. In happy to be here. Thank you. Back here in the International Space Station flight control room, flight controllers are monitoring the systems on the station itself ahead of Dragon's arrival Wednesday morning. Once Dragon crosses, crosses that approach ellipsoid, which is that mythical sphere around the station, flight controllers here in Mission Control Houston will begin joint operations with the SpaceX teams in Hawthorne, California. NASA astronauts Rasha Chari and Tom Marshburn will be monitoring the approach and arrival of Dragon with a planned docking Wednesday morning at 3.30 a.m. Central Time, 4.30 a.m. Eastern Time. Once Cargo Dragon is docked to the station, Chari and Marshburn will begin hatch operations to open the hatches between the International Space Station and Cargo Dragon. And with that, we have final confirmation that the nose cone is open. So with that, everything is still on track on the International Space Station side. So that'll do it for us here in Mission Control Houston. Happy holidays. And now heading over to Kennedy. Megan. And that's going to wrap up our launch coverage of SpaceX's 24th Commercial Resupply Services mission. Cargo Dragon, as you heard her say, is on course to dock to the International Space Station at about 4.30 a.m. Eastern Time tomorrow. We will have live coverage here on NASA TV, and that will begin at 3 a.m. In the meantime, you can learn even more about this mission on nasa.gov slash commercial resupply. Thank you for joining us. We leave you with a replay of the launch. Happy holidays. T minus 15 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Ignition. Liftoff. Cargo Dragon soars with the final supply run of 2021 to the astronauts aboard the International Space Station. Stage one chamber pressure is nominal.